So the United Kingdom messed up things pretty badly for Ireland. The British people have voted to leave the European Union. For many in the UK, it hadn't yet dawned what the consequences of this departure would mean. We will restore confidence for people and help unleash a pent-up tidal wave of investment. But for Ireland, the threat was immediately apparent. Brexit meant geographic and political isolation from the rest of the European Union, and the possibility of reigniting 30 years of political violence alongside its border. Brexit threatened to take down the United Kingdom and bring Ireland down with it. But the Irish economy is powering forward, in part as a result of Brexit, and British companies have mostly moved to Ireland. It's almost as if Ireland had won Brexit. But was that the case? And if so, what was the cost? That's why I'm in Ireland to find out. So this isn't a video about Irish history or politics, but before we talk about Ireland's economy, we have to make a couple of pit stops through history to explain how Ireland got to where it is today. As a result of both 300 years of British colonization, which ended in 1922, and geographic proximity, Ireland has been extremely close to the United Kingdom economically. Though Ireland, as a result of this colonization, has historically been much poorer. Both this poverty and closeness meant that when the UK joined what would become the European Union in 1973, it was unthinkable that Ireland could stay out. For Ireland, this offered a new way of decreasing its dependence on the UK, by developing closer ties with mainland Europe. Over the past century, Ireland's reliance on British trade fell from nearly 70% when it gained independence in 1922 to 12% today. On top of EU membership, which allowed goods to circulate freely between Ireland and the UK, this closeness was underpinned by two more agreements. The Common Travel Area, which was agreed in 1923 and allowed Irish and British citizens to travel across the British Islands. And there was the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, which resolved contentious issues around the Irish border, which had sparked decades of political violence. When Ireland joined the EU, it operated a radical economic transformation. And by slashing taxes and focusing on tech and services, it turned from an agricultural protectionist state into a modern economy. Ireland became known as the Celtic Tiger for its impressive economic performance. But this performance might as well be called the Americanization of the Irish economy, since it was built on American money that started pouring into the country in the 1980s. Ireland became the United States' gateway into Europe, such that some Americans started calling it the 51st state. In doing so, it basically became an economic rival to the United Kingdom, which itself also focused on the service industry and on attracting American investment. But Ireland, as an English-speaking tax haven, which, unlike the UK, was committed to European integration, attracted more American firms and investment, which funneled their profits from the rest of Europe to low-taxation Ireland. Look, I even found who pays my paychecks. In 2015, as Ireland prepared to close its tax loopholes under pressure from other European countries, its GDP increased by 25% in a single year as companies shifted both cash and intellectual property to Irish subsidiaries. This resulted in what economists call leprechaun economics, or the fact that the country's economic success is not anchored in reality and doesn't benefit its people. As a matter of fact, Ireland's strategy to becoming wealthy has created a two-tiered economy. On the one hand, it has its local industries and companies in sectors like manufacturing, foodstuffs and agriculture, and on the other, its large base of mostly American multinationals. This is best visualized by the difference between GDP, which in the case of Ireland is artificially inflated, and gross household income, which represents how much Irish households actually take home. This difference is because the international economy accounts for roughly 10% of jobs, but a whopping 52% of total GDP. It means that much of the wealth brought in by multinationals is not shared to the general Irish population. And that has had a large cost for Irish people, who, despite the apparent wealth of the country, have seen their income stagnate. As we'll see in a bit, these two Irish economies have had different fates and fortunes as a result of Brexit. But before we move on to the rest of the video, first a word from our sponsor, Wondershare. The first step I take into making any video is extensive research looking into government and think tank reports. And at some point in the research process, both the PDFs and the tabs overwhelm my desktop. And I just need to be able to keep track of everything I read. And for that, Wondershare reached out with their PDF element tool, which is a PDF management and editing tool that can help streamline any process. With PDF Elements, you can easily annotate and highlight important sections of your research papers, add sticky notes and comments, and organize your documents in a way that makes sense to you. But that's not all. 
PDF Element also offers powerful optical character recognition technology, which means you can quickly and easily convert scanned documents and images into editable and searchable PDFs, saving time and effort. With PDF Element's easy-to-use interface and features, you can focus on research rather than spending hours organizing and managing your documents. So if you're looking to optimize your workflow, go check out Blendershare in the description down below. Now back to the video. So of course we can't talk about Brexit without talking about the impact that it had on trade between Ireland, the UK and the rest of the European Union. Most of Ireland's trade with Europe actually went through the UK to what's called the Irish Sea Land Bridge. The tight network of ports that connect the two countries, across Great Britain and then through the English Channel. For trade with the European mainland, ferry routes have opened up, connecting Ireland with France and even Spain if you're willing to endure a 30-hour boat ride. While they transport passengers willing to pay the hefty ticket price, like me, everything for the purpose of the story, their main purpose is to ship goods. In fact, shipping goods has increased by 600% between France and Ireland since Brexit happened. Of course, it's still a fraction of the volumes that go across the Irish Sea, but the companies are rapidly expanding their operations. While Irish imports from the UK have decreased, likely as a result of additional customs procedures at the Irish border, Irish exports to the UK have remained remarkably consistent, in part because the United Kingdom has only limited border checks on goods coming from the EU. For example, this massive truck park for customs by the UK remains mostly unused. It has served to process the cats of Ukrainian refugees rather than EU goods. In fact, one of Ireland's main fears of being cut off economically and geographically from mainland Europe hasn't materialized. And if anything, Brexit has actually helped to connect Ireland to mainland Europe. But the thing is, these trade routes are raising costs for Irish people. They're more expensive, they take longer, and they're not as developed. And so they contribute to Ireland's cost of living crisis. The other thing that Brexit affected was the Irish border. It threatened to reignite political violence between Northern Ireland and Ireland by disrupting the circulation of goods and people. But just three days after Brexit was announced, the British Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, announced the UK's commitments to the common travel area. On top of this, there has been enormous pressure on the United Kingdom by both the EU and US to maintain the Good Friday Agreement. The Northern Ireland Protocol, the part of the Brexit Agreement addressing the status of the border, has left Northern Ireland following EU customs law, allowing goods to continue circulating at the Irish border. Instead, the checks take place at the Northern Irish ports. This has contributed to deepening economic integration between Ireland and Northern Ireland. So a lot of the threats associated with Brexit for Ireland haven't materialized, and in several ways, Ireland directly benefited from it. That very subtle building behind me happens to be the office of Goldman Sachs, which moved here in 2018 after Brexit. And it so happens that that building is right next to the Irish Ministry of Justice, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. And the reason I'm here is because we have to talk about Ireland's Brexit dividend. If we look at the numbers, Ireland has attracted the most UK-based firms out of any European country, mostly American firms that had set up shop in London instead of Dublin. Their reason for choosing Ireland are the same as before. Low taxes, business friendliness, and commitment to European integration. In 2022, Ireland GDP once again made a huge leap forward rising by more than 12%, in part due to cashing in on the so-called Brexit dividend. Brexit eliminated one of Ireland's main economic competitors, both in the services industry, but also for continued investment from the United States. Since Brexit, the entire Irish services industry has grown by 60%, far faster than it has in other services-oriented countries like the Netherlands. This is great news for the first Irish economy and the government's tax revenue from all these new multinationals. And it's also a dividend that may continue to pay up as the UK continues to diverge from European regulation with its coming bonfire of EU legislation. Despite all these developments, which Ireland could only dream of, Irish politicians have been particularly gloomy. If we put these things in the context of Ireland's two-tiered economy, then we can see that this Brexit dividend is likely to lead to more benefits to Ireland's multinational economy and will only have limited benefits for Irish households. Brexit is actively harming the indigenous Irish economy, which is far more dependent on trade with its neighbor in sectors like agriculture, food, and traditional manufacturing. In fact, since 2015, Ireland's gross national income has been diverging from GDP at an accelerating pace. In 2021, the European Union announced a Brexit support package for which Ireland was the largest beneficiary which the Irish government promptly directed at small and medium-sized enterprises that employ most of the Irish people and are the ones likeliest to struggle. And the likely lackluster economic performance in the United Kingdom over the coming years means a difficult time for Ireland's indigenous economy. It simply doesn't pay to have a poor neighbor. 
While Ireland's decoupling from the UK over the past century has meant that Brexit is no longer the cataclysm it could have been, and Ireland has on some level benefited from the situation, Brexit still is bad news for the country. But what do you think? Can Ireland reinvest its Brexit dividend in a way that benefits the whole country? Or will it be dragged down by one of its largest trading partners? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. This was Interrupt. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I love making these videos which take time and money to create. Feel free to go check out the Interrupt Patreon to help me tell more stories about Europe.